Hi, everyone, and welcome to the MLOps podcast. I'm your host, Dean, and today I have with me Federico Bacci. Uh, Federico is a data scientist and ML engineer uh, at Bol, the largest e-commerce company in the Netherlands and Belgium, where he's working uh, in the forecasting team, solving all of the company's forecasting problems. He also has a background in software engineering, uh, but he moved to machine learning as soon as he realized the importance of it for a future. Uh, so Federico, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Dean. So let's dive into it. What does machine learning in production look like uh, for your team at Bol? Okay, so machine learning production, like that depends, of course, a lot by who is using this machine learning. So most of the machine learning that we actually create is uh, used by internally in the company. So in production means that it's actually helping a real problem. So there is the entire pipeline that is actually working. Um, going in production in general for a whole model, most of the models is means uh, having the result published. As you can imagine from forecasting problems, most of the kind of problem that we are trying to solve are non numeric problem, so regression problems. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to keep things in production and running. It means mostly that we need to have everyday accurate results. Now, there are other uh, different models that need to be a little bit more interactive uh, with the user. And those models being in production means also that there is a, a wrapper, a service around it, and needs to be always available for that. And every time that we deploy a new model, it needs to be uh, checked, needs to pass the test. Okay, so one thing that you said, which I already think is uh, very interesting, is you're, you were talking about this as if the entire pipeline is owned by the ML team. Is that is that the this, this situation uh, for you? Um, I think in the way that the stakeholder perceive us, in the entire pipeline is, uh, of course, made by us. Of course, we know that there are some input, but usually uh, our stakeholder uh, see our result as a ground truth. You know, you try to use us, uh, you, look at this result and without knowing what were the feature that went into that. So, so many times actually we are saying, hey, this is not the, the problem is not our machine learning model. Our, mach our machine learning model just didn't receive information from the team that was before. Mm -hmm. But so, for example, on the technical side, uh, so you, you would need to collect the input from the relevant business teams uh, and then incorporate that into the data set that you're training the model on. Uh, but you're saying that basically that conversation plus building the model plus the actual deployment that is all managed by uh, the team so it's it's not like because some organizations you know you would have the ml team and then you would have the ml ops team or the deployment team and they pass that along but you're saying that you are keeping the pipeline internal to your team which is very cool yes yes i think the this is something indeed different that i saw a different organization that our team uh, was also the team that created uh, this ML Ops um, tool that is a fork of Airflow to actually manage all this pipelining. So the business value and the ML Ops teams are, and the ML Ops uh, actually actions that are happening are happening in the same team. Okay, that's great. And uh, the so I guess maybe if we zoom into a specific uh, model or project, how, how do, does the deployment process look like? So if you can walk me through uh, one example. Okay, let me take you through one of our largest models that it is a demand forecasting uh, problem. So how many, let's say iPhone, or is the company going to sell? How many do we need to have in stock? Um, we use features that are coming from other teams and they are picked up by pipeline. In this case, we are using a Google Cloud Platform, but it doesn't really matter where you're picking the data from. We are picking data from uh, a specific table, processing those data, and then we are doing some quality check. After that, uh, this is, I'm talking mostly for the prediction in general. So this is the flow for a model where it's already there. 
take the model, uh, take the data, uh, check the data, try to predict if everything is all right, then there is an output. Uh, and we do, of course, data quality check on the output, and there is a perf performance check in general. But how does it go with training, for example? Well, with training, usually uh, we create a copy of the entire pipeline. We try to edit the changes, edit the experiment, and then uh, there is a way to compare the different models. And then if the comparison is successful and waiting for the new model, then there is a new variant, and then uh, this new variant is immediately merged into the master pipeline, where then it can continue uh, going with, uh, as the normal flow that I explained before. Okay, so if I understand from what you're saying now, uh, you sort of have uh, two layers of tests. One is after the training phase, like to evaluate the model performance, but then you're also like merging it in uh, you you maybe refer to this implicitly, but does that mean that there's also like an A-B test or a cannery deployment where you're not putting all of the traffic on the new thing? Or is there just one model at every moment? Um, <laughs> this maybe is for forecasting, so it's, it's more challenging than if it's like yeah. a recommendation system, for example. It is challenging just because the user are internal. So the application that then use our uh, result are also internal into the company. And an AP test, when there is like, yeah, maybe hundreds of people using it, but it's only just hundreds of people using it, it's very difficult. What we try to do, um, since we have a very, uh, a lot of different uh, way to compare numeric, numeric results, um, we do, uh, we call shadow run, means that when there is a new, version, a new model, it's just there. We are looking at the result, how different they are from what the users are actually seeing. And if it is good, good enough for us, we don't need to tell anything. We just uh, go and merge to the new flow. Every day, the results are different. So if it is a big change, of course, we want to take uh, with us the stakeholder. But if it is just a smaller change, uh, they will just notice that it's going smoother uh, overall. Okay, that's that's actually a really good uh, practical point that I think uh, would be relevant for a lot of people. So if you're building uh, models iteratively and you're trying, and correct me if I'm wrong in anything that I'm going to say, but like if you're building models iteratively and you have new versions every day, then you might ask yourself, like, why would I choose shadow deployments versus uh, cannery deployments versus A-B testing uh, in, in production? And your answer is basically that depending on the amount of users, that, that sort of dictates that strategy. So for something like canary deployments, you need the most amount of users because you need to be able to say like 5% to this model versus 95 to the old model that will still yield uh, statistically significant. If you have slightly less users, then you go with the A-B test if you just split them 50-50. And if you have uh, too few users, so you're talking about hundreds, I think that that's like a good bound because you, I, I think there's, I, obviously like it depends on what, level of statistical significance you need but i think for most people like if you want a rule of thumb if you have hundreds of users let's say under a thousand then you probably don't have enough to a b test and get meaningful results unless they're very intensively using the the model and then you go with shadow deployment which just because maybe some people in the audience uh, are at least familiar with that term uh it basically means uh that you're deploying the model in parallel to the production model it's getting exactly the same data, but it's just not showing the output. And then you use the future data, which is like the labels in this case, to make sure that the difference between the shadow model to the real model is uh, uh, like it, it's better, right? Like you have a smaller difference from reality. And then you can switch over. Uh, did I get that right or, or did I miss anything? Yeah, that that is exactly what is happening. Um, also, one of the reasons that I know that in the company, there is a lot of um, focus on A-B testing and making the customer directly decide. So I know that, for example, the recommendation does that. Uh, the team behind search do that because they have a direct feedback and immediate feedback uh, of what is happening. And it's very difficult to, let's say, shadow run something because there are so many external events. Let's imagine that it's a sunny day. Uh, the company, the e-commerce is selling a lot of swimming pools. 
then you don't know if your uh, if your results are influenced by that or not. So that's why you why you need an A/B test. But when there are a lot of rules after the number that you have that you deploy, it's difficult. So for example, to put it in uh, more forecasting terms. One of the models that I mentioned before is a demand forecasting model. Uh, when you forecast demand, there are other rules on top. So for example, if we say that we are going to sell more of a product, but then the person that is looking at that product decide to not stock the product, the question that cannot have an answer, it is how can we know how much we would have sold if the product wasn't stock in that moment. So this okay. is very difficult to capture in numbers. So this is why we need to have a constant feedback, of course. So there is a feedback loop. I have some suggestion about that one. But in general, we try to uh, make it in, in a flowing way. So every time there is a new release, a new model, it's just like flowing in the same direction. And we trust the overall number. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that feedback loop actually sounds super interesting. If you can share your thoughts about that, do, do you mean, by the way, internal feedback or external feedback, like uh, running a simulation of how much sales you would have gotten if there was more stock? I don't know. Well, that would be that would be awesome if the, a tool like that would exist. So, running a simulation of what would could have been things. It's uh, quite interesting. If you know something that does that, let me know because it does sound awesome. But the truth is that um, there are still some manual steps. We are trying to automate everything. So this is the idea of machine learning. You try to automate all, every possible decision because, well, we know that most of the time uh, humans can make more mistakes than, uh, than the model if they are well trained, right? because there are more checks. At some point, you cannot check everything. Uh, but sometimes, on the other hand, the humans see some patterns. I mentioned before about swimming pool. Sometimes there is just like an heat wave. And I'm in the Netherlands now, and when the sun is out, trust me, people want to be out. Um, so then everything from sun lotion to swimming pool starts to sell a lot. And this is where the feedback loop is important. There is a human usually having a look at this kind of promotion. And when he start to notice that, for example, some parts are not very well forecasted because last year, maybe in the same time period, there was uh, a rainstorm, then say, hey, this is what is happening. First of all, we expect that this is happening. We expect that there is uh, a check, at least um, an approval or not of what we are with whatever number we are um, having there. But we also have like, we prepared a form. Usually they were sending us emails because again, the people that are buying are internal, but then we try to automate that also through uh, a, a form. Just say, hey, we know that usually this is, uh, these are those, the problem. Is one of those problem or not? And this is really helping us into prioritize what are the most requested features from the people that are actually using it. One of those, for example, is the reactivity to weather. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very, that's, uh, that's very cool. I think that the, um, what I wanted to suggest earlier, uh, it's not a simulation solution, but uh, if Bull was a startup, uh, I don't know if, if it's passable at the size of a company like, uh, uh, like that, but if it was a startup, you could say like, what if for some cases, when the product is sold out, I show it as not sold out and they only tell the person it's sold out after they click like buy. Uh, and then I can measure like how many people would have actually bought that thing. Uh, but it would annoy a lot of customers, right? So there is a trade off there, but theoretically it could be, uh, it could be a nice solution. That sounds like an experiment to, to to do but there is a there is indeed a button it is a notify me when uh, sure. this is, becomes available so it means that there is interest but one of the interesting part that we also monitor is how many people in general looked at specific page views uh, it's called page view feature but then we noticed that sometimes this was not really helping uh, the number so it was actually confusing more the model so this is the interesting part not all the 
features that you think that are useful are actually useful. Not all the features that you think, oh, this, there is little correlation. How can the model pick that up? Well, this is the interesting part about machine learning. The model can actually see things and pattern that usually you might can't. Yeah. And you, you also mentioned the like uh, sensitivity to uh, weather, there's seasonality, there's a lot of these like more complicated uh, interplay of variables. I'm curious, like there, for, for uh, forecasting, I, there's all, I mean, this is true for all fields of ML, but I think in forecasting, it's uh, even more pronounced is sort of this uh, internal battle between using the best model to using the best model that is still explainable. So I'm curious how you think about that and like what's your internal solution uh, around so, this? This this has been uh, a topic because we recently uh, tested with um, uh, forecasting, time series forecasting based on LLM or with more recent transformers based model like the TFT. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems simple. The point is, has never been the model. This seems, seems that I'm wise now, but the point is never the model in itself. The mo it's how the model is perceived by the actual user. So one thing that I'm quite proud of, it is that there is always this idea of machine learning explainability and uh, feature importance, and you need to understand why things are in that way. But the question is, is that so important? Let's imagine that you give a feature important to, importance to a person that is on the business side, and they are like, I don't even know how those features came to be. Like, thank you for this information, but this is not useful to me for my daily job. And the easiest way to actually show what was happening was really to plot the features on a graph and say, those are the feature, those are the input that the model received. Those are the input of the previous uh, days. And those are the output that the model put out. Do you see the correlation there? Do you see that those are on the same scale? And already people say, ah, yeah, now I understand. People are looking at it a lot. So maybe there is something else going on. So there is an external event. Uh, we know the uh, soccer um, soccer match, maybe football match, could be something that uh, put people to look a specific item and not. And you cannot see that in the future, but you can see that, for example, people looked at a specific item more. And looking just at the result, it's very difficult to say why it was like that. But most of the time, people look at the model. Oh, it's machine learning. It's a black box. No, well, it's not a black box. The, actually, that's the most easy to explain part. The difficult to explain is all the things that go into the box. So if you can explain that, that's 90% of the job of machine learning explainability, I think, is gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you said earlier that you were using transformers for the forecasting. Have you tried using transformers for the explainability, like to see those connections? Uh, maybe a version of GPT that has access to the internet saying like, oh yeah, yesterday or I guess two days ago was the finals of the Euro. So maybe people are uh, looking at soccer stuff because of that. <laughs> that is something that I, it would be very nice to have. But then you go into the problem that not only you need to make a very good machine learning model in the first place, but you need to make a second machine learning model to answer the feedback for the first machine learning model. Sure. So I think there was this uh, idea, how much time does it take to automate something that usually it makes very little? So the idea of uh, having a dashboard where you can just say the date and the product that you're looking at and asking what were the feature at that point in time and what were the previous and uh, future forecasts because sometimes you're, seems like taking a time machine going back in time, those were the things that at that time and those were the things that we knew in the future, that makes sense. And most of the time the answer is yes. So without going too far, too far away, it's really just, this is the number that we had at that moment. So the question is, was the machine learning model wrong or were the number wrong? Or actually were the number telling a different story that neither the, uh, the user, neither us of course, can oversee. Maybe sometimes the, we notice that there has been uh, an error someplace else and uh, 
product has not been labeled in promotion, but it was selling crazy. And now we were forecasting like crazy because no one actually labeled that promotion. I see. So yeah, that, that makes sense. I guess um, the the way I, I'm imagining this is like, you're, you're basically saying that if you can bring the explainability down to a very practical sense of exposing the things that the users do understand uh, in just a way that's accessible to non-technical people, then those people can just look and say like, okay, now I understand the, visually the relationship between those things. I guess one thing that could help, uh, it, I don't, maybe this is too specific and, and it's fine if you can't answer, but like, can you give an example of some of the features and, and how you plot them? Because that maybe is counterintuitive to, to a lot of people. Hmm. Yes, that, that is counterintuitive indeed, also for the people that look at them because even the idea that you have, um, contrary to what you think, uh, first of all, uh, our biggest model is, you would think that it's a time series model, but in the end it's a aggregation of different models that, uh, that it's an ensemble that do different things in time. But already that is uh, complex, so we have course documentation, but do we expect that everyone reads documentation? Of course not. Uh, people have better stuff to do, but um, we try to say, okay, this was the label of the actual model that was used. But then if we go back in time at that moment, those were the things that we knew at that moment. Because, you know, the problem with forecasting, the, this is an um, uh, easy fallacy, fallacy, I think, uh, happens also in uh, stock trading. Say, oh yeah, of course I should have bought that stock because I know that it will go higher. Yeah, you can only say that after it went higher. So it's very difficult to know that a product would have sold a lot after the event happened, right? So many times we are not dealing only with feature, but it's also humans before in the data that come in and humans that read the data out. So it's difficult and the explainability, it's mostly in to interlocking those uh, those information and making sure that they are speaking the same language. Let's say. I see. Okay, that that makes um that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then you mentioned the bits of uh, like transformers and uh, time series and stuff like that. Can you share a bit about like your stack? What uh, uh, what tools do you use to manage the machine learning project? Yeah, you mentioned also like a variation of Airflow, but uh, whatever you can share about that. Um. So. Actually, we tried with transformers. There has been like, uh, who is going to be the best new model? Is it going to be the transformer or is it not? Uh, our biggest model, at least, it is uh, it is using uh, LightGBM. That seems fairly simple, but it, in the end, it's years that it doesn't get him beaten by all the other algorithms. So transformers are useful if you're just starting with that. But if you have good enough features, then the models start to be less important. The most important part, it is the feature and the loss function. That I think is the most important in, in general. Uh, if, because if you change those things, they have a way higher effect. At some point there is so little that a model can learn. But let me go better into the stack. Uh, most of uh, the data, uh, I mentioned that uh, Bol is using Google pl Cloud Platform. Um, most of the data that we are using are, well, are huge amount of data. Um, so we are talking about terabytes. I know it's only numbers, so compared to some other teams that use images, some other teams that do NLP and embeddings is still less. But in general, in the company, what is most used is uh, uh, is BigQuery. That is a SQL variation. In the end, the data can be just tabular. Let's use the most uh, scalable tabular way that the cloud offers. So we need to think less about that. Uh, and the good thing is that other teams are using the same kind of tabular data. So we can just read from their table. And the good thing is that in Airflow, what is happening is mostly that we are reading from table and putting data into table. So feature engineering, um, mostly we try to do also mostly 
not in Python, but directly in SQL. This is very difficult because when you study data science for the first time, you say, yeah, I just do everything in Python. Yes, but there are problems. And then you end up with problems with Panda that it cannot be a distributed system. I know there are some ways to make Pandas more distributed. There are uh, NumPy ways to make Pandas faster, but you can just go around all those ideas and just use something different that is made to be scalable. Of course, this is slightly difficult when you need to do something like uh, scaling or um, type of uh, data changing that you cannot really do in SQL, but you need more Python because there are some libraries. I mean, I don't want to reinvent the wheel there. But the idea is that data are edited directly in BigQuery. So there are different tables that are created during the time till the table that is then used by the model. And this is where it starts to be interesting. We have something called ETL that is the main source of information for all our models. And then we have uh, another pipeline in the uh, Airflow language, they're called DAGs, that uh, are graph uh, formats. And this is where then Python is entering and then data science is actually happening. Then, then you need to already have a smaller model that is usable and possibly can enter into either a pod or a distributed way to uh, do that in Kubernetes because Python is then running in Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're using uh, Airflow to, or the your flavor of Airflow to orchestrate all of those data pipelines. Yes. Yes. And are you using anything uh, like any tool uh, for deployment or is that like more uh, internally crafted? Um, so depends what do you mean to, for deployment? So uh, a survey our... and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, not all our models actually need serving in that way. So sometimes it's just a pipeline that run as soon as it's done predicting in the night, then the day after you have newer data. If something went wrong, then you can use the day before still is usable data in that case. Um, when there is actual deploying means that usually the, uh, the new model is saved uh, in a format in the cloud, in a storage bucket, and then uh, we deploy a new version of the service that takes a different model from the one that we were using before. Okay, I see. Um, and I guess last last big question before we go into the rapid fire ones, but uh, what's like, uh, the, I don't know, I, I wrote this down as like, what's the biggest challenge in your machine learning efforts? But like, What's a challenge that you overcame that if I'm a data scientist listening in or an ML engineer listening in, uh, like I could maybe uh, take from that and apply it tomorrow in my work to, to, to be a bit better? Uh, it sounds uh, cheesy, but I think one of the biggest challenges in general in uh, machine learning and data science, it is uh, people's skills. Sometimes you really need to go there and try to stay at the same level of the user to understand uh, their feedback. So when there is an easy feedback loop, then it doesn't really matter anymore uh, machine learning because you can do the best model ever, but no one is using it. So you can bring more value into decreasing that uh, loss function even more, but then it's a small percentage. But the biggest value is it is usually into listening the people that are using your models creating a feedback loop and creating a, a really trust. So sometimes, for example, there was um, a big shout out to, to my team uh, for casting that there was a stakeholder that noticed something was going wrong in, uh, in, the, in the model. And they say, hey guys, I think I see a pattern here. And for us, it would have taken days to actually analyze all those numbers, but they are using that, say, hey, you know what? You're right. That's very easy to fix for us. And then we bring uh, we bring this coworker chocolate because they figured out a pattern. So in the end, I think uh, people can be a stakeholder and people can be really um, uh, a use of, uh, useful resource in that way. Fair enough. That's uh, that's a good tip. I think that um, I I listened to another podcast or 
people were being interviewed, uh, I think from Anthropic, I might be mistaken, uh, but they had someone on the team, like the, 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 you know, GPT and everything. If you talk to it in, uh, in uh, like uh, um, uh, Bay 64, right? Uh, it, it will respond. Like it knows a lot of non-human languages uh, and you can theoretically talk to it in those languages. Uh, and they were noticing that um, when they were looking into different uh, representations in the neuron space, like the parameter space, they noticed that it had like three main uh, parameters for uh, for Base64. And two of them were like different flavors of Base64, but they had another one which they didn't understand like when it was being activated. And they had someone on the team who's like a really crazy Base64 nerd or something. And he noticed that it's uh, it's triggering for every base sixty four string that is also uh, ASCII repre- like representable. So that's like a super niche thing that like most normal people will not know. But having that internal communication and like sharing the problems that you're working on lets the people that do have that knowledge sort of share uh, share from that, and and many times lets you overcome challenges that you would have spent a lot more time on if they weren't there. So. Um, I couldn't agree more, is basically what I say. Um, so let's do a few uh, rapid fire questions. So one is, uh, what what are you most excited about right now in the fields of machine learning and AI? Oh, I cannot really get enough of uh, information about LLM, what is happening. I'm uh, applying and actively using uh, also LLM myself. Uh, I just cannot get enough of what is possible there. Uh, the idea that you have in general neural network, but also the idea of transformers from there on, it's just like such an open field. Unfortunately, it's not really applicable too much into forecasting uh, because it doesn't solve a real problem in, in terms of numeric problem. It would not really help in that way, but it's still so interesting, the idea that there is knowledge to be extrapolated from just repeating the next uh, the next possible word, the, ne- the next possible token. There is it's something that is still ooh, crazy, I think. Yeah, and you, you can also, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you, you are to a certain extent, but you can also use it to build better models because it helps you code and everything. Uh, I saw a nice demo of the cloud with the new artifacts and everything. You can literally like ask it to improve something and then it just does it and gives you the code. It's very convenient uh, and co-pilot, of course, as well. So, um, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I guess on the sort of maybe other side of the coin, tell me something that you think is true, but few people would agree with in the realms of uh, machine learning and AI. Well, uh, I'm sure that people that are working on it would agree, but in general, not everyone. Um, Everyone... We say all the big companies are trying to put intelligence and uh, machine learning and LLM into production with the most weird use case. LLMs are not always the answer. We know that they are useful, but they are not always the answer. That is not still not AI. That is just predicting the next possibility. And we saw so many times. I think I was reading about uh, what was, I think, uh, a car company that put a chatbot with an LLM and it came uh, to suggest um, what was like a, a legal, uh, so legally it could actually create a coupon for another car company. So they tricked the chatbot to actually give a coupon legally binding for another car company and in that's not necessarily what you need. That, which kind of problem is it solving, right? I think I think that car company was uh, Chevrolet. I, I, yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think uh, that's what you were talking about, and it was very funny when I saw that. Uh, wait, I actually had um, uh, Idan Gazit from uh, GitHub Next on the podcast a few episodes ago, and he was talking about like building AI native products, like where. AI actually needs to be integrated from the ground up. So he was working on GitHub Copilot, of course, which I think is a good example of uh, of an AI application versus a lot of not as good uh, examples that are out there. Um, but yeah, I I, uh, I 
tend to agree. I also think that one of the reasons for that is just that people have not seen enough good examples. So it, they're like over attached to the single most successful example, which is ChatGPT. But there are other ways to do ML and AI and integrate those into products that are not just like chat with your product or whatnot. Um, but but that's that's a, that's a good that's a good hot take. Um, yeah, I think, and I mean sorry. people are using that uh, every day. Like, let's think about recommendation or the idea of representation when you look something into Google. When you search for something, those are machine learning. They are not they are not using uh, LLMs. They are using machine learning from the ground up, and that's I think the interesting part. So LLM are not always the the answer. That's uh, what I think is uh, the answer here. Uh, and let's finish up with uh, recommendations for the audience. So it doesn't have to be related to ML and data science, whatever you feel like recommending. Chen. Uh, so what I'm getting interested, so try to, not always, I have this problem that since I'm working a lot on code all the time, I tend to focus specifically on the use case that I'm going for but try to grab ideas, try to grab things around. So I say I'm uh, interested so much in LLMs. I just say, okay, let's take a use case. Let's try to put, build an LLM and see if it, that works. Put in the ends directly in the dirt and try to come up with ways to make it work. That's really the thing that helps. And of course you can apply pretty much on anything. So it's, I don't, I know it's very generic, but it's more a state of mind. Just try it out and see where you stop. It's it's difficult because you're so focused on your daily work, but don't forget the development time, like development in a way that development of yourself into putting the hands in the dirt in something totally different from what you're doing daily. I think that's, uh, it's, it's very true and it's easy once you find like a comfortable place to stay in your comfort zone. Uh, and like uh, getting out of it is is critical uh, and actually doing things as you say like it's not just like reading uh, it's like I I, re I was telling you earlier I think I, I read a I read a paper uh, this uh, this week and it was very nice but now I want to actually write code like uh, it's not it's not enough to just read papers you need to actually do stuff uh, and the recommendation that I have uh, for for uh, this time is uh, I actually want to recommend another podcast. Uh, so there is uh, I got a good recommendation for a podcast called the Dwarkesh podcast. Uh, it's an interview podcast, so similar to this. There are a lot of conversations with high profile people. Uh, I think Elon Musk was there, Mark Zuckerberg, stuff like that. But there's also a lot of people that are like hands on people. So there was a good conversation with one of the people from Anthropic and another people from a uh, person from. Uh, Google working on Gemini is really, really good. I forgot the name, but I'll link in the episode like to the, the names of the people, but I'll uh, link in the, in the description. And there's another uh, very long episode split into two uh, with a guy called Carl Schulman, who's like uh, thinking a lot about uh, AI risk. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of conversations about uh, AI risk and public battles that I think are not that interesting because people don't get into the nitty gritty details. And he actually like outlines some of the thinking around that, which I found very insightful. Uh, and so that's like uh, each, there's two episodes, each one of them is like three hours. So it's pretty long, but I found it very interesting. Uh, so I recommend those. Uh, and um, Federico with that, uh, thank you so much for taking the time today. This was a pleasure. I learned a lot and I believe the audience uh, will too. Um, yeah, thank you for, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And thank you to the audience. I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to the MLOps podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like the video or subscribe. If you have any feedback, leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.